Hey everyone, it's good to see you guys. I'm really excited today. We have a special guest with us. Uh, his name is Mark Rosenfeld. He's Australia's number one dating and relationship coach. His passion is empowering women to take control of their love lives and find help them find authentic companionship with the man that they deserve. I'm also here with co-host slash host Laura. Um, I'm really excited to dive into this conversation. I've been, I mean, Laura and I have been doing this for the last two months now, just interviewing relationship coaches, doing live coaching on our channels, um, and emotional intelligence, conscious relationships and dating has, has really been the main subject and focus of the entire series. So we're, we're really looking forward to this. Thanks for coming on, Mark, and taking some time out to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's brilliant. Jumped at yeah. the opportunity. Cool, man. Cool. Uh, so, Mark, I, I guess where I wanted to start was, like, you've been doing this work. I mean, I thought it was so cool. I was reading your bio, and you were originally a, a male stripper and got slowly into this work over time. And I was like, that's so badass. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was working as a veterinarian, moonlighting as a stripper, and then figured, you know what, I'll just take things in a different direction and be a relationship coach instead. Uh, no, it's very re rewarding. Um, and it was, yeah, it was an evolution for me. I came from my own background of actually severe social anxiety. So mm. coming up from there, uh, getting into stripping eventually was kind of the, the peak of that mountain and, and conquering fears in that area. And then it's sort of... and. The stripping is cool, but um, it's not something that you can obviously do forever. And it was always more of a side thing. And and I've loved just helping people connect. And that was kind of where I transitioned from my old mm. science background, which was mm. in veterinary studies, of all things. What for, like, when it comes to relationships, what do you think is most important for people to understand or recognize or develop. Uh, I mean, for me, I, I grew up in a very closed off family and then society didn't really teach me those skills. So I kind of just had to struggle through it and figure out how to connect to people authentically, how to create relationship. Uh, I guess like what's, what for in your experience, what are the, what's one of the most important, I guess, facets of development in, in relationship that's most beneficial for a person? Yeah, I mean, there's so many different directions that, that you can go with it. And there's so many things that relationship brings to our life. I think one thing that that's always worth remembering is that relationship and connection is in some ways the opposite to attraction. In that attraction, you kind of see online, you see someone who's perfect or, or has a perfect job or has a perfect look, or you think they'd, they'd look really good on your arm. And in high school, that's kind of all the criteria that you use for potential relationship is it's just kind of a transaction, who will look the best with me, who will kind of bring up my value the most. Um, and it's a very attraction-based mindset that is then just kind of propped up by chemistry, basically. Oh, we have good chemistry too. And that's really how high school relationships form. Uh, but true connection is actually built in the ditches. It's built in the low points. It's built in the vulnerable spaces. And it's built in the things that, that aren't so superficially attractive or that aren't so perfect. Um, and it's the acceptance of those and the, you ask any long-term couple, what's your what's your thing that kept you together? In fact, my, my own parents had their 40th wedding anniversary uh, on the weekend, which is super, that's super great. beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I was that's just awesome. like, so, I was like, wow, 40 years, that's incredible. Absolutely incredible. And they, you ask these long-term couples and they always say it was the hard thing the losing a parent together the struggling through an illness the getting through a, a, a rough business or financial patch that made us stronger mm. so I, I think it's interesting that the very things that are so powerful in high school that that all the fuels of attraction are not really the things that build connection in adult mm. life mm -hmm. yeah that's true and i see that in people like when i coach people they can we talk about the a lot on our channel like idolizing someone seeing someone thinking they look like they're going to be the perfect fit they're going to fit the fantasy they're going to be like the person and then they don't yeah. they don't see the reality and then when they do see the reality they're like oh god i don't know that i can be with this person it's like but they were always like that Nothing yeah yeah it's it's funny but is um whatever you've been through in high school and i certainly had those wounds as well was you always kind of want to date the the fantasy person the 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 person the popular person often the really attractive person often 
Um, mm. And then sometimes you get the gift of actually dating them for a while and you're like, they're fucking useless. Like, <laughs> they're not bad people. But, but relative to me, they're not putting in the effort. Or like, like my partner now said it really well. She's like, yeah, I always thought that that guy would be great until I dated like, what was he? Like Mr. I think it was Mr. New Jersey in a couple of years in a row or something, a lawyer. And she's like, and then I dated him and he was so emotionally unavailable. It was a nightmare. Yeah. Um, and, and that was when I finally dropped the fantasy about, you know, the hot guy. Um, sometimes you have to experience it to just really flick your nervous system and get it. Mm. But if you can drop the fantasy without actually having to waste a couple of years experiencing it, even better. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, Laura and I have, have been talking about this series of the difference between being in love with an idea of something, whether it's being in love with the idea of a business, a relationship, a type of person, and then actually going with the feeling in real time, because it's the feeling in real time that is the best way to navigate or guide us to what feels really good and what doesn't. Yeah, yeah. If you're going with the idea, you're really just still transacting through mm -hmm. that person, which is that person just a means to the idea that you want. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be very hard to build relationship off of, off of that good relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone, if someone was like, I don't know whether I'm in love with the fantasy and the idea or the actual person, what advice would you give them to make sure they're really choosing something that would be valuable to them? I'd probably have them get a clear vision of what they want if they haven't done it already. Mm -hmm. And to mm -hmm. set that person out of their mind for a moment and say, well, what is my vision? What what am I looking for in a partner? Uh, and then basically look if, if the two match up, um, not what he might be or what he could be or the potential, but what is he right now? And you might find he's physically, he's exactly what I want. Socially, he's got his own friends, uh, but emotionally, he's useless. He's not around. And, and that might give them the clarity to see the difference between fantasy and reality. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I think. Uh, I think that was one of the biggest lessons I've learned along in my own journey. Where there was people who were like, "Man, they look picture perfect," and but it's it's like that old high school pattern. Or yeah. That social, like the more we focus on our external image or the social, the social self, it's like the less available we can actually be for our like the the, the real good stuff. And like the real good stuff, I've noticed, it comes in those moments where it's like it's very personal. Like it's not out there and it's, it's not about the image or any of that other stuff. It's really just about what's happening here right now in this moment between you and I, and I, I don't think we really build, there's not a lot of stories though. Like we don't have a lot of models in society that, that build that up or hold that up. It's always like, Oh, there's this perfect relationship and there's these two people and they're doing, they're conquering the world together or they're, sharing these struggles and it's like, well, actually relationship is pretty mundane. And if we can find a lot of beauty in connection in the mundane on a daily basis, then like, that's, that's really it. I think. Yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I have one of the big frustrations I've dealt with, especially in COVID times is women who they've maybe been dating someone or they've had a relationship. And then that guy has gone and uh, maybe they've broken up for some reason or he's broken up with her. And then, pretty quickly men do what men often do which is we don't want to feel our pain we distract from our problems <laughs> and he goes and gets a new girlfriend um, uh, and so they're in they're in quarantine feeling pretty bummed and mm. of course this isn't just a quarantine problem but men often do the rebound thing a little more than than women do mm -hmm. and so i've had a lot of clients over the years but especially recently come to me and sort of say like i mean he looks so happy with her like why wasn't i adding their own narratives why wasn't i good enough um, they they just they seem like they're so perfect. That's my should have been my relationship, and I'm just like, you have no idea what's going on behind closed mm -hmm. doors, like none at all. They could post the perfect Instagram photo, they could be so happy that night, but often the couples that are the most toxic are the ones that are just doing these ones up and down, and you see them at the peaks because they're never going to share the troughs, <laughs> right? Um, it can all be such a facade that you just, you don't know what's going on behind closed doors. Yeah. yeah. I see that a lot. In fact, I know that uh, an ex of mine who from years ago, like he would post these, these perfect pictures of him and his lady. But then when I tweet to him, he hated her. He hated yeah. her. He was like, 
well, why are you posting like these pictures? And he's like, well, you know, I want to treat her with respect. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not, it's just not real. It's fake. It's like, not real. Authenticity is, is yeah. There's, yeah, there's not many pictures of, of me and my partner online. You, you post a couple here and there, but it's, you always know it's the behind closed doors stuff that mm -hmm. makes it real, makes it quality or makes it not. And, and only mm -hmm. an individual couple of fly on the wall could ever really answer that. You can't know from right. the outside. Yeah. I love the direction that that's going in. Cause I mean, Mark, Laura and I have been talking about how like the things that are almost most sacred to us, which I would say, you know, I was reading this research article. It was like 75 year plus study on Harvard. I always talk about it. Laura's probably <laughs> sick tired of hearing it. But, uh, <laughs> but like, they found they, they interviewed 70, um, over 768 men over 75 years. And they like did tests by bi bi biology tests, blood tests, like questionnaires every single year. And uh, some of these guys became rich. Some of them became famous. Some of them became poor. And they found that, what made life most fulfilling uh, across the board, the results were um, being a part of a social community and having healthy relationship. It, it had nothing to do with fame or societal, meeting societal expectations. It was, it was actually just feeling a part of a community and, and being close with another individual. And, I, and I, I thought that was really cool because I mean, a big part of modern society thrives on these narratives of us believing that we have to have these these beautiful lives on the outside. And so many people, even in relationships, live into that. And, and that's kind of the dynamic that you're talking about is it's like, oh, well, you know, I think my like the, this person we just broke up. But if they see us as. You know, if, if they see that I'm doing good, then like that's what's more important than actually how I'm really feeling. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. We we really, and you can see if you go to you know if you've ever watched those little docos on those African tribes that are the poorest in the world and the happiest, yeah. you kind of see it where they're they're just they're doing what human beings have always done. <laughs> hanging out in small communities, having a good social support network and usually mm. having one or two people that they're extra close to. Mm. And that was really how humans were built over hundreds of thousands of years. So it's, yeah, it's not surprised to, for me that study that just says you go back to basics, do the mm. same thing that humans have always done to be happy and you kind of get the magic formula. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how would you say you can bring that into a relationship? For people that are looking to connect with someone and they're looking for a relationship, how do you think you bring in the simplicity of that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think being really real to your own experience, which we're, we're so used to just, oh, I should put the image out. I need to look good with this person. Um, when you really disconnect yourself from the opinions of others, as, as simple and cliche as it is, and just go, well, what's my experience? Okay, I'm feeling sad about the relationship, so I won't post. You know, I'm just going to... I'm going to stick with things that feel good for me. I'm going to move away from things that don't feel intuitively healthy or right for me. Mm. Um, and yeah, sometimes a coach can help you spot that stuff. Sometimes you can spot it on your own, but moving away from that conditioning of, of high school and maybe just kind of saying, well, where, where am I living out kind of high school stuff here? <laughs> versus what's actually making me happy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's, there, yeah. it's, it's amazing how, how a lot of that stuff just comes right from high school and then to college or out of college into the workforce. And it just never, it never really ends unless it's yeah. out on it. Yeah. We have such a weird society now because we are so exposed to things that easily make us feel inadequate, especially mm -hmm. in high school. Um, just, just perfect images, perfect brands, perfect kind of everything that it's a, it's a weird time for humans, isn't it? You kind of, you're exposed to a bunch of things you never would have been before yeah yeah I, re I just read this one study I, in case you can't tell i really like studies uh, <laughs> it was uh it said that millennials will have like five to six careers like that's the average whereas you know our all of our parents and grandparents had one or two probably just because we're ex we've been exposed to so many different ways of living and a lot more information and that's really unheard of like that's only been around for mm. like 20 or 25 years so everything is kind of being called into question from human identity to human relationship to what a what a good life means like all this 
overflow of information. It's just everything shifting really, really quickly. Yeah. 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 yeah 100%. What about, sorry. We, no, no, you go. Go. Yeah. Well, so what about going even higher to a higher level? Because like the work that Jared and I are doing, we talk about having very conscious relationships. And I know that him and I have both experienced this where you get to a point in your life where you've done so much work on yourself and you're good and you're like, you're solid and you're individual and you fall in love with yourself. Like I know I've had that. I know Jerry's had that. We've talked about it. I literally fell in love with myself as a person, as a woman, my sensuality, right. sexuality, everything. So then right. what, what happens then? Because <laughs> <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> I don't need anything. I don't need, it's not like oh, I don't need a man. It's more like, but I already have me and I love me. So how do you match that? Because it feels like who could love me more than me? Do you know what I mean? Like I love myself. I don't know anyone that could love me as much as me. I do a great job. I take really good care of myself in all ways. How do you match that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's an interesting way to phrase a question. I guess for me, I always say sort of, you know, I can be fine without women i can live without women i can survive without women but i'd never want to um they always light up my life in such a way that that there's always more that they can add and the depth of feminine that you know whenever i think that i know my feminine my partner will go 10 times further into hers and i'm mm. like i have no fucking idea about my feminine <laughs> so i think there's always when you put two polarities together, obviously, typically a feminine woman and a masculine man will always be able to go deeper into their own energies. And so, you know, my partner will always show me new depths to feelings that I can experience and new mm. levels of support that I can experience and new, mm. new, e even wounds that I didn't know I had. You know, we, we literally just had a conversation yesterday where we identified a couple of things at which it, and she said, this is just never a conversation I would have ever had if I was single. I, I just mm -hmm. never would have picked up on this. Yeah. So I, I think there's so much to relationship that it just exposes stuff that you didn't know you had. And it really does present a whole new aspect for growth mm -hmm. that, that, you, that you probably just wouldn't come across when mm -hmm. you're single. You, mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just different. There's certainly things that single that you wouldn't come across if you're stuck in relationships all the time that you wouldn't learn. Yeah. Yeah. So it because you have this other polarity there, um, and especially I can only speak from a man's experience, obviously, but when you have this woman there to, she's so good at holding you to integrity or, or calling you out when you're not or, or challenging you to step up, or there is a extra light that that person brings in that I just couldn't ever do uh, mm. on my own. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I think sometimes, I know just for me, when I, when I look back at some of my own relationships, I could see where I was like, okay, now I get it. Like now I'm balanced. Now I'm yeah. in my masculine and my feminine. I'm, I'm solid. And then there's still something like that comes up. And I'm like, okay, well maybe there's, there's still always more. So, I mean, I, I love the question, Laura. I thought it was great. The, the best way that I could think of it, I guess maybe is just like, I guess the only way if you would know it would be if you get in that relationship from the state. I mean, so Laura and I were talking, I think this was either last night or the, the day before, where it's like, when I, go, when I go to bed alone, like I feel good. Like, like I feel like I can hold myself how girlfriends used to hold me. <laughs> like, nice. Yeah. You know, nice. It, 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 it kind of sounds weird when I say it like that, but I'm like, wow, this is, this is cool. Like, <laughs> you know? And, yeah. No, that's so nice. Yeah, and so it's like I'm, I'm, yeah. I don't know. It's a great question, Laura. I have no idea. I really don't. You opened up a can of worms. <laughs> no, no, I get, I get curious, right? Because I, I mean, I'm an airy, so I can't do anything that doesn't excite me. I can't even buy a bowl of cereal in it if, if it doesn't excite me. I can't do it. So for me, there's so much excitement in my life. I wake up, I go to the beach, I drink coffee, I have clients. Like I love my life so much that it, it becomes. I think when you become that conscious, there is, um, there are men out there that are conscious. I'm looking at two right now, right? But um, there's only so many people that I notice that can be where I'm at and mm -hmm. be on that level. And so, like, I get, I, I get asked out sometimes, and people, and I just like, no, nah, I'm not, I'm not excited about it. I'm not excited about it because there's no um, consciousness to that person. I think that in order for us to be in a connection, both people have to be conscious. 
I, I would you agree with that? Because I think if you date, if you're conscious and you date someone that's unconscious, I don't know that they can wake up so much when they're in the relationship. I could be wrong. I'd love your opinion, but I believe that both people have to be pretty conscious for it to to work, and not just one. Hmm. When you use the term conscious, it, it's not a term. I know it's it's more of a spiritually aligned term. Yeah. It's not a term I've ever used to describe myself. So I'm curious, mm -hmm. is it are you describing self-awareness? What are you when you talk about conscious, what, what does that define that for me? Yeah, like consciousness to me is someone that's self-aware. They're aware of their own self, they're aware of their past self, their future self. They're aware of people around them on a deeper level. They're not sort of in the matrix of just get up, have some coffee, have a shower, work. Unconscious mm -hmm. living, asleep living, they're more awake and alive and they're kind of thriving. That, that to me is someone that's conscious, I would say. Mm. Yeah, I could definitely see how it would be if you get someone who's just going through the motions, you're not really going to vibe with them. I'm sure I would find the same thing. Yeah. Um, th that being said, you know, I'm, I wouldn't say that conscious to me at least the way i conceptualize it is is a medium that's something you move along it's not you're unconscious or you're not it's just you gradually as you peel the layers become more conscious mm -hmm. i'm sure there's a million things that i'm unconscious to right now that at some point i'll get i don't know what they are yet um but yeah you you've i agree you've definitely got to find someone who's kind of on your awareness level and yeah. then taking over that i i do think there's um there's people around that that have that but yeah, it can be, you've got to spend some time, you don't want to be settling kind of thing for someone you don't feel can can get you, isn't on your wavelength for sure. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mark, what, what would you say is the, like when it comes to creating, a, I guess like a deep relationship, what would you say is most important for both individuals to, to recognize or to acknowledge as they come into the relationship? Because there's so many times where I'm, and just when I reflect back on my own life, but also with clients where that person's still seeing their significant other or their partner as like a need that they're having met as opposed to someone just outside of their own needs and wants and desires. Like, does that make sense? So there's like perceiving someone as, okay, this is who they are to me, but then like, this is who they really are beyond me. If that makes sense. Um, no, can you rephrase the question? Would you say it yeah. again? Yeah, I, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a pretty deep question. Like, sometimes I'll talk. Sorry, man. I <laughs> no, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. It's making me think. <laughs> like, sometimes I'll talk with, with a client and they'll be sharing with me, like, something about their partner. And I'm seeing, like, in that moment that they're not seeing their partner as, like, an individual, independent human being with wants and desires. They're only seeing them through the lens of what they need and want. Right, like a transactional mindset. Yeah, yeah, like a transaction. Okay, that's it. That's a great term to use. Yeah, tra like a transactional. How, how have you seen people switch from that transactional sp space to a deeper, like, oh, wait, this is – like what it means to be in a true relationship is to see people beyond my own needs and desires and wants, which sounds very, I think, basic for, for us. But I know for at one point in my life, that was hard for me to do. I couldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. It really forces you to cross that boundary from conditional to unconditional love. Yeah. It? Where yeah. you go from this person's good as long as I'm getting my needs met versus I have to respect this person's boundary and I have to look after this need myself. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a it, it's a thing we go through as we evolve, I think, in relationship. And, of course, there's still valid needs that, that you want a partner to right. meet. You know, like you, you're in partnership to have, as you said in the study, being in partnership, <clears throat> excuse me, being in partnership meets a lot of our needs and gets us feeling good on a regular basis. So... The journey from differentiating that, I guess it gets to the point where you say, okay, my partner has put up a boundary. They've said, okay, this is their truth. They don't want to meet this need or they can't right now or they they are basically saying my line ends here, my identity ends here. Mm -hmm. And initially that's going to kind of piss you off, especially if you're in a bit of a transactional mindset at the time. So that's really where your relationship evolves, isn't it? That's where you say, okay, I'm here not just for the good feels, I'm here 
am I, do I want to stay here when it doesn't always feel good? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's really adulting, isn't it? Do I want to be honest when it doesn't feel good anymore? Do I want to be authentic when it doesn't feel good? Do I want to go into confrontation about this important thing when it doesn't feel good? Mm. So it's sort of, it, it mirrors the, the journey of adulting a bit, which is how, how willing am I to not feel good uh, and still stay in this situation? Mm -hmm. and I guess that's, a, that's a, something yeah. that every individual in relationship has to decide. If mm -hmm. there's abuse going on, well, well, no, I'm not willing to feel shit and stay here. Right, right. But yeah, yeah I don't know if that answers the question at all. No, that's, that's, it's more of, it was more of just an exploratory question because I see it come up so much. And I, I, I think like as what you were saying earlier, Laura, about like, can, is it worth getting in a relationship with someone if I can't feel better? Like, they, like if you're in a relationship with yourself, it's going to take someone at a really high energy level to be able to make you feel better than you make yourself feel. Yeah. And I, so like, it's, I don't know, there's just a lot opening up right now. I can barely keep up with all of it. So I think it's just, I think it's just an interesting thing to, to think about. Cause a lot of the times when I look at relationships, sometimes I'll say it's like, okay, I'm going into this relationship cause I want something, but mm -hmm. can I give that something to myself? Or do I really need to get it from someone else? And, it, and I guess at what point do I, at what point do, am I just going out of my way to, to get something that I can just give to myself? I guess if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think if we take something like validation, mm -hmm. you know, it would be remiss to say you should never be validated by your partner. Like, of course, my partner validates me. Of course, she makes me feel good. But I guess the question would be if there comes a point where she doesn't or where she can't do that at the time or where she's not willing or able for whatever reason, do I have the tools, resources and willingness to validate myself in that moment? Right. Yeah. That's a yeah. great example because there's times where I'm like, you know, like I'll take like a, a hit or a gut punch or something like that and I'll be like, I'll go internal and I'll like start, you know, it's positive self-talk. No, man, you're cool. Like, it's all right. You're, you're good. I love you. Let's go on a walk or have some organic gummy, gummy bears or something like this. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> like, that's my like comfort food is organic gummy bears. And, nice. and, and, and then like, I get back into it. I'm like, okay, I'm like back on the calls. I'm back talking to people. But yeah. like, I could imagine though, if I just had like, maybe a, a woman in my life where like I get gut punched and then I'm just like, can you hold me real quick? And she'd be like, you're good. You, 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 you got this. Here's, here's some gummy bears. I'm like, sweet. That's so much, that's so much easier. I can just get back in the place. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's certainly nice to have that person. I, yeah. uh, I can speak from a man's perspective. If I'm like having a down day, uh, it's nice to have that person who's like kind of brings me back to integrity, which is like Mark, this isn't you kind of slaps you or it's like, yeah. Hey, you know, you've got this step up and that raises, you know, that re inspires me and re reminds me to raise my vibration as a man. Mm. Uh, but at the point where I'm expecting it and it becomes a transaction, you should be picking me up. Mm -hmm. I suppose that's the point where it's, I'm, I'm no longer valuing her for her. I'm valuing her for what she. Right. Can right. 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 Yeah. 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 So I guess, I it's that, oh, sorry, Laura. No, I was just going to say, I see that a lot, like validate um, people falling in love with how someone makes them feel or what they can do for them rather than the actual individual. And I had a, uh, a call with a client recently who was talking about, you know, we were saying about unconditional love or conditional love. And she was saying mm -hmm. to me, well, the thing is, like, I'm not happy with him because he has all these struggles. But if I love him unconditionally, shouldn't I be able to stay in that even though i'm not happy am i not happy because i'm putting a condition on how we should be but i believe like if you look at the sanskrit word for tantra it's it means compassion and wisdom intertwined that's what the, the ancient teaching is it's compassion with wisdom so we can have compassion we can have understanding we can we can have that within a person but then you have to have the wisdom to know when enough is enough and so yeah. i guess my question which you'll be able to answer really well mark because it's kind of what you do it's your thing when is the when is for the people listening what is that cutoff point like oh hang on a minute i'm not that happy but it's okay 
we are riding through something, we're learning through something. When is the cutoff point to be like, I need to use my wisdom here. And this is the point where I need to either step away, stop waiting, stop waiting for a text, stop trying and actually turn inwards and, and do my own thing. What, what's the cutoff point? So great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think what, there's this connection between unconditional love and always staying. Yeah. And if you're in unconditional love, sometimes it means loving that person enough to walk away and let them handle their stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you can unconditionally love someone and, and let them go, you know, mm -hmm. let them you need to be on your own journey here. And that can be an act of love is, is mm -hmm. moving away. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's important. On a more practical level, I usually say to clients, well, is this because because every relationship is going to have problems. Um, John Gottman talks a lot about this. Every relationship is going to have problems. More importantly, that will never get never get solved. Mm -hmm. So, on a practical level, is to say, okay, if this problem never changes, uh, are you okay with that? Oh, yeah. And simply just saying, okay, well, is this an unsolvable problem that you're okay to live with, or is this an unsolvable problem that's a deal breaker for you? Uh, and it's that that usually separates potential from reality. I, I love that. I, yeah, that's, that's, I loved, I love Gottman's work. And we had um, a Susan Winters on about two weeks ago. Yeah. And we kind of, we kind of got into this territory and she made a really good comment. She said, you know, like some problems, they're not like, they're not solvable. They're not fixable just because you have different value systems. Mm -hmm. And really at that point, it just becomes a question of, am I willing to be in agreement with, still being in this relationship and not making the problem a big deal. Um, and sometimes like, that's like the best thing. I, I think Gottman's research says that the most successful marriages, the ones that like where people actually go till they die are the ones where someone has an issue or a problem and the, and the, and the spouse or the partner's just like, okay, <laughs> they don't make it a big deal. It's like, I see what's coming up. We don't really have to solve it. And then some of the couples who really try to solve it and be like, Oh, I got a nitpick and we got to fix this. And we got to break this pattern. Like that actually causes the relationship to, to crumble sometimes. And it's so funny. Cause I never, I, I never thought of it that way, but it, I mean, it's pretty genius. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think Gottman says up to 60% of problems in long-term successful relationships just aren't solvable. Right. Um, okay. Wow. And, and the couples just say, look, he just does his thing. It's fucking annoying, but that's who he is. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> He's, a, he's late, whatever, right? And some people being late is like super triggering. Others is just like they roll their eyes a bit, have a chuckle, and that's that's all of it. Um, but yeah, I think probably the myth that you have to solve all your problems is one of the biggest because we, we live in such a society where it's like, if I can just get the right person, I won't have problems. It's We have such abundance that we just think, if I can just pick right, I can duck away from the problems. Um and there's always problems. There's better problems and there's shittier problems, but there's always, always problems. And because we're human beings, we tend to find that, you know, like whatever is our shittiest problem feels shittier, right? <laughs> so it, it becomes relative. Yeah. So you've just got to ask yourself, whatever's the shittiest problem in our relationship, is that something I'm good to, if it doesn't change, am I good to still be here with that? Right. Yeah. I love That's that. I, yeah. 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 That's kind of what I, when I think of like therapy and I'm not going to bat, I don't bash it or anything because I did therapy for six years. But then once I discovered coaching, I was like, man, this is so much easier because I don't got to focus on like why I'm so fucked up 24 <laughs> you know, like yeah. I can just focus on, I could just focus on being a better person. And it, like the orientation itself just felt so much lighter. And, it, and it's kind of like that. It's like, well, you know, you might have this part of, your partner's personality that maybe grind up against your value systems or just maybe gets you upset a little bit. But then once like, you don't have to go in and nitpick or try to fix or, Hey, let's go to counseling to get and Sometimes it's just as simple as look, I accept that part of you and it kind of pisses me off, but I'll get over it. Like I'll get over yeah. it. And, you know, and like, that, that's compassion. Like that's comp as long as it's not affecting you know, you to a point where it doesn't, where it's a, like you said, like a deal breaker. Right. Right. And, and if it is a deal breaker, sometimes, as I said, you just have to say, okay, this person, maybe they are crossing boundaries of yours. And you say, look that I know that's not healthy, but they have to go and do their own work. So I have mm -hmm. to love you enough right now to let you go and do that work and mm -hmm. not have my life. 
Yeah. Yeah. You love them enough to let them fall. I think someone said that to me once and I was like, well, actually, that's Yeah. That's how we learn. Like I've had people say to me, Laurie, you should probably do this and do this. And I'm like, Yeah, maybe. And I don't listen. And then when I figure out my stuff, I'm like, damn, they were right. So true. It's the same with kids, like if they're gonna run around, you say, Don't do that, you'll fall. You gotta let them fall over and cut their knee, and then they won't do it again. Like people have to have experiences. Um, yeah, pain's really important. I mean, we yeah. forget that. I used to work with dogs, and um, if if there was ever, if you ever got the um, the nerve block in their mouths wrong, you had to be really careful because it could block their tongue for a few hours, and they'll chew the damn thing off if it's wow. blocked. <laughs> so you need the pain feedback loop. It's very important. And mm-hmm. if someone's been going in the wrong direction for a long time, either in relationship you need to give them that that gift of feedback, which could be a, a walking away or some kind of rejection, something like that. But that's that might be the exact feedback that person needs to finally mm-hmm. flick it into their head, like I should do things differently. Right, right. Yeah, I love that. I mean, you look at all evolution in any industry or business, it's pain that drives innovation and everything. It's like, it's, yeah. it's, it's not a bit. And I think so many times in relationships, like that's what we try to keep people from experiencing, like we try to save each other, like that codependent kind of mindset where it's like, oh, well, I don't want to hurt them or I don't want to, well, it's like, well, you know, the best thing that we can do is not try to shield people from the lessons that they need to learn or shield them from the pain that's, that they're inflicting upon themselves. And I mean, that's a whole nother conversation about dependency, but yeah, I mean, you look at, you know, my um, my part, she's away at the moment and she was complaining to her grandma, like, oh, we don't get to see each other. And her grandma was like, well, back in my day, you and your grandfather, well, I was with your grandfather, he went off to war for a year and I only got a phone call every few days to even know if he was alive. <laughs> right? Which is a bit of a grandma mic drop. Um, <laughs> but it's it's interesting because we have so many means now to reduce pain. We say, well, why aren't relationships as strong as they used to be or as solid as they used to be? Well, they haven't had the the pain exposure, so they're not going to be. Um, the the more the more you can tolerate hardship and difficulty together, the more solid you become. Mm-hmm. But if you remove all the hardship and difficulty from life, which we've kind of done in this day and age, things will be much flimsier when they're put under pressure. And we're seeing so many breakups over what's quite a minor virus, uh, historically speaking. It's This is a very minor pandemic. Um, but we're seeing a huge amount of breakups because we haven't had any wars. We haven't had any real pandemics. We haven't had any actual of the hard stuff that that would fortify couples. Mm. So under quite a light strain, there's a lot of a lot of cracks that are showing, unfortunately. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's... You know, I I have a background in the military and that was one of the things that we are always taught. Like that's all our training ever was. It's like, hey, we're going to stick you out in the field for two months and we're not going to feed you and you're going to figure out how to survive. And then you're going to come out in two months and you're going to love each other. And like, that was exactly it. Like you'd, after those 60 days out in the wilderness, you'd come back and you'd be like, my God, like that was horrible. I never want to do that again, but I love this guy next to me. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, That's very cool. Very yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, I, think, I think like, like you were saying, I think that pain threshold is it. There is some sense of that being important where we're facing external resistances or hardship that brings human beings together there. There's definitely a beauty in that. And even in little ways, in in the micro trend, not transactions, the micro interactions in relationships, um, people say, you know, I want an authentic partner, I want an honest partner, I want a vulnerable partner, um, and everyone, when they're feeling good, can do those things, right? Mm-hmm. But, but the real test of a partner is, well, how much pain are you willing to tolerate to be vulnerable? Mm-hmm. How much pain are you willing? How authentic are you willing to be? with increasing levels of discomfort when you do it, you know, how much, how much pain will it be before you no longer do that? Mm -hmm. And so it's important even in just these, the values in relationships is if you want to, if you want someone who's really going to be resilient with you and and stick with you, then you've got to know how they're going to go when, when the system's under pressure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a video that I, um, that you did a while ago that I saw on your channel, Mark, because, I checked you out obviously before this. So yeah, I yeah. About. And then, and I think it's a probably quite a good time to bring it up just so that people understand there's a fine line 
with putting up with shit and then and not and because I get a lot of clients that I work with that are like oh they, they've waited for someone for years mm-hmm. and, or they've been in really bad relationships and they're like oh Laura I've just got to help this person or I've just got to yeah out. yeah great just, point like there's such a fine line and I think you did a video it was about the the what was what's the person like towards the end of the relationship versus what they're like at the beginning so many people are like oh but when i met him or her they were amazing we did this, we did that. Like, yeah but that was for like three days he's been in the office <laughs> three years so people focus on the beginning when everyone's on their best behavior or when everyone's trying to create the relationship rather than the actual individual yep. so i'd love for you to go into that just so that people know was that the 80 20 video yeah yeah. So yeah. there was a simple rule which it says take 80% of your perception about a person from the last 20% of the time you've been together. Mm, wow. Yeah. Because we usually put our best foot forward at the start. Yeah. yeah. Which is, it's, it's sort of your, you're as good roughly as your latest um, show, essentially your latest performance. Now, obviously, stuff's going to happen and sometimes people go through stuff and, and there's exceptions. But, but overall, seeing what's in front of you, because, again, it's like you're saying, Laura, it's, it's about what someone really willing to do and willing to be and how much are they willing to invest when it kind of doesn't feel very good to do it. Mm. And that's how you build those really strong, amazing foundation relationships that are just so mm-hmm. solid behind closed doors. Yeah. Wow, yeah. Um, I, I want to make one more comment there, but, Mark, I'm just going to go to questions here pretty soon. Are you okay with taking a couple yeah, questions? Yeah, 100%. Cool, guys. If you guys if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them there in the comment section, and and I'll bring it up on the screen here. Um, I just wanted to kind of bounce off of Laura's point. Like it's funny for me. I pretty much now I'm like I I do both feet forward. Like there's no good foot forward. I'm, I pretty much be is like I say it all on the first time I meet with the person. I'm like, look, like this is the whole of me. And if you think I'm coming on too strong, I probably am. But like here it is like, this is like the 80, 85, 90%. I'm not gonna, like, I'm just gonna, uh, I'm just gonna save us both time. And I've actually had like a lot of success with that. Cause it really just speeds everything up. And like, you get, it almost kind of got to the point where it's like, okay, am I just trying to get through all the patterns as quickly as possible? Or, <laughs> you know what I mean? like, but, but like now, I'm at, now it's kind of just at the point where it's like, I don't know. I can just sense the whole person, their patterns, what they're about. And, and I'm like, look, here's the whole of me. I'd love to see the whole of you. And I like, here it is. Like, if you, <laughs> like, there's only some things you can get from uh, obviously experiencing and being with the person, but most of it, like you can pretty much get out there right off the bat. And it's mm. it definitely, I don't know. I, I feel like an old man when I do it, but I'm just kind of, I got to the point where I was like, I'm just going to, like, I'm just going to say it pretty much all of it, 90, 85, 90%. Like, this is the whole of me. And if the person gets overwhelmed, like, they're not, the fun. They're not, they're not it. <laughs> like, and it might not be the best approach strategically if you want to date. But if you're, you know, if you're solid within yourself and you feel really good about it, then it's like, dude, I can play this yeah. however I want and just make it fun. Yeah. I like that. I was chatting with a woman yesterday and she said she's had a problem with needy people. And then she said, well, sometimes I don't want to text back too quick because I don't want to be needy or I don't want to seem needy because I've experienced so much of it. And I said to her, well, are you needy? <laughs> She's like, no, no, I'm not needy. I just don't want to look needy. I'm like, well, here's the cool thing. If you're not needy, you can do yeah. needy shit and you won't be needy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. like, if you're genuinely not needy, you can like, I remember I had a partner, she'd in, in all caps, she'd send me, hi, I want attention, attention, please. Like she just sent me these texts, right? But because she wasn't needy, she, you can get away with it, right? And it's that's, funny and it's cute. That's right? so funny. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Underneath it. Yeah. So it's actually going to be what comes through. And and I guess that I learned a, a, a probably like six months ago about the rejection thing. Most people don't want to put stuff out. They don't want to be rejected. They don't want to be pushed away. They don't want to feel that. But I said to my one of my clients the other day, I was like, if you just let go of the idea of being rejected, like it's not personal. If it's, it's like kind of what you were saying, if you just put yourself out there and they don't like it, they don't like it. That's fine. That's who you are. Because um, I used to tone myself down when I dated. Yeah. 
I have a really high energy. I literally wake up at 4 a.m. I'm like, boom, here we go. What's the day going to bring? Wow. <laughs> but people don't know what to do with that. They're like, what? what you're too much. Like, so I would be like, oh, I'll just I'll get up at like 6 and I'll just slowly, you know, like I'd have to tone myself down because I was afraid that the real me would be rejected. And when mm. I let go of that, like, if you don't like it, that's fine. Because I do. And I'm, I can't be anything other than who I am. That's too painful. Awesome. So it's awesome. like if we if we release that idea that someone's going to say no to us or that they don't like who we are, if we can just if we don't care about that, mm. everything is so much easier and smoother. Rejection is a massive and thing. faster too, because you yeah. very quickly you get people like, oh, I'm not vibing this. You're like, sweet, yeah. thank you. That is yeah. such a time saver. I've been dating yeah. for two months now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. Totally. I'm going to go to uh, Mariana's question here. She, she says, um, I'm not sure what the conversation was before. She says, and then I'm accused of being selfish and narcissistic. How do I deal with that? Mm, there might have been another conversation up there earlier. Let me see. Can you guys see the comment section on the right side? Yes. I um, haven't. Oh, there is a comment section. Yeah. Oh, wow. I see it. I didn't know there was a comment section. Oh my gosh. I know this this software is so cool. I'm like totally yeah. geeking out about it all the time. <laughs> okay. I don't even yeah, Mariana, if you could share that question again, that would be perfect, just so we have some context, because there's a lot of comments here. So I'm gonna go to let's see, who else? We'll go to Dante's question here. I guess my question is at the point of fulfillment, I'm not sure a relationship makes sense for either of us. Distraction is the enemy of creation, and we're both now mission work creative. Okay. So it looks like, yeah, there's so many conversations going on right now. So it looks like he's asking if you're in your missions work, like you feel like you're living your soul's purpose and you kind of have some feelings for someone, then is it worth going into the relationship or not? It, it seems like that's the question. Is that what you guys are picking up? Yeah. Like if you're fulfilled yeah. with yourself and your life, if you're if you're in a good space, I mean, I suppose that's really up to the individual. But uh, I suppose as a man talking, I'm, I'm always saying, well, is bringing this woman in going to allow me to be more of that? Is she right. going to allow me more freedom, in the sense that more freedom to pursue my passion? Am I going to be more full by having this this feminine energy to call me when I'm out of integrity or to balance me? Um, yeah, so beyond that, I guess it depends on individual circumstance. If you're just so laser-eyed that right now I've got to bury myself, then you might not have the, mm -hmm. the space for that. Mm. Well, I, Laura, that kind of goes back to your question. And yeah, he clarified. I think that was it. Um, that goes back to what you asked a little bit earlier, Laura, when you said, like, how do we get, like, if I feel really good within myself, then do I need another relationship? But Mark, I love what you said there. It was kind of like a magnifier. Like, if, a, if you already feel really good within yourself and then you have another person who comes into your life and they magnify those aspects of you kind of like, I don't know, you know, like there's that saying, yeah. if, if you get drunk, like you, like if you're an asshole when you're not drunk and then you get drunk, you're just more of an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. So it's, it's kind of like that. That's, I don't know, that's what I was thinking. I, I just loved when you said the word magnifier. Like, that's what I would imagine it would do if you if you were good and happy with yourself and then another person who is at that same energy level or consciousness level, I'm guessing they would just magnify the qualities that you already have. Yeah, I think one of the simplest questions I ask clients when they're a bit like, oh, should I stay, should I go? I just say, when you're not physically with him, like mm -hmm. when you're living, when you're, you're a couple, but when you're not physically with him in the couple, are you more fulfilled, more happy, more energized, blah, 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 than you were when you're single mm. or, or are you less? Mm -hmm. Has his effect brought you up or has his effect brought you down? Mm. And that's kind of one of the simplest ways to, to really identify is this person magnifying me and allowing mm. me to be more or is this person, am I, do I feel like I'm shrinking in mm. this relationship? Yeah. yeah really good point that's a good point because i think um like i know i've been around people where i think oh, i love who i am when i'm around them so i want to be around them more and they're fun and they bring it and it's like we get up to adventures together that's kind of a good thing knowing the difference of what it feels like when you're with them or when you're not because sometimes it's difficult to figure out if it's right when you're with them when you're not then you can kind of mm. see it. exactly got, when you're physically not in the room with them you're like do i feel better for this relationship like exactly. am i more 
Yeah, and, and I, I mean, I know for me, and it's probably sounds bad, but as an empath, I can feel people's energy. And I think I've stayed in relationships for too long before because I could feel how much they loved me and I thought I loved them. But then when I wasn't around them, I was like, didn't think about them, didn't really care. But then I was with them, I was like, I love you. But I think <laughs> you can feel like their feelings towards you and you're like, I don't really know how I feel. So yeah, yeah. Space and distance to really understand, like, do I actually feel? Because I've done that. I've done that. Yeah. I I think we all have, or a lot of us have, especially yeah. as empaths. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I know I have. I mean, there's been times where I kind of took something for granted. And then once it was gone, I was like, oh, shit. I actually <laughs> got a lot more than I realized. And I kind of fucked this whole thing up. Yeah. I mean, speaking of studies, and there was kind of a question on this before, is that there's a lot of studies that have demonstrated men tend to look back on relationship with the much more grass is greener point of view. Um, you ask them about exes or uh, former former wives 10 years on, many years on. Men are just they have this really high vision of it. They'll, they'll say, yeah, she was she was great. Or they're more likely to give that relationship a good rating versus mm. women are much more likely two years on, give it a lower rating. Uh, huh. And the, the, there was a little question earlier. Uh, someone said about men, men rebounding and recovering from relationship more quickly. Mm -hmm. Um I just want to clarify, men do rebound more, but that doesn't mean they recover more. Uh, the mm. rebound is more of a distraction rather From than a... Family. Yeah, it's, in fact, it's women that, that usually recover a lot more effectively because they actually process things. Um, but I just want to clarify that because there was a comment. That's great. That. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, for me, I, I know when I look back at all my relationships, I was... I did not recover well. <laughs> like, like I, I showed yeah. it on the outside, but on the inside, I was like, "My God, I'm crying." And yeah, like, yeah, you just stop oh, school. You or, miss them. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, you miss them, and you you feel it, and it's just like, "My God, this this is a horrible feeling." But it was. And, good. And us, no, I'm sorry. You go. I was just gonna say, us men, we get so few spaces in life to really safe spaces to really share feelings that the occasional women that spot through our lives are really the only places where we get that kind of safety. And so it becomes very rare and very memorable and very special. Mm. Whereas women are so much likely, more likely to do that day to day that the feeling side of things doesn't, it's not quite as unique for their romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. It's cool. I'm at, I'm at the point now where and I think Laura and I have been talking about this. It's like the first point in my life where I can actually hold space completely for myself and it's a really i mean i i've been doing so awesome much. yeah and, and not not that I'm, but but like now it's like oh i'm i'm not afraid to lock myself in a room for a week if i want to and i'll be fine like there's it's like a, i have that sp created safe space within myself if that makes sense yeah yeah i think that's that's awesome, so yeah. that's so valuable but i got that from war that was a gift from war once you i think experience that much violence it's like I need to create safety within myself. Yeah. Uh, and that yeah, was, wow. was one of the greatest gifts I was given from, from war experiences. Cool, man. Do you mind? We have one more question, then we'll close up. Does that sound yeah, good? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Cool. So there's a uh, – man, there's just a lot that just came in. But, well, let's see. Well, There's one about yeah. Jansi, and there's one that Elijah's posted. Um, you want to you wanna pick that, Laura? Well, someone was asking how you handle jealousy. Jealousy for me personally is the worst. I'd rather be heartbroken than feel jealous. It's such a horrible emotion. But yeah, how do you handle jealousy? Yeah, good question. Good question. I've got a couple of videos on this. I, I think you've got to check in and, and is this is this intuitive and is this something that's rather than actual jealousy, is this your intuition, you know, ticking something off that mm. that is fair and reasonable? Like, because often it is, and other times we pile our own stuff on it, which even if it is your own narratives, and even if you say, my boyfriend's been 100% low, he, he's totally open phone policy, it's I, like, I think it's stupid that I get jealous over these women, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. But that's still a valid emotion, and it's still a legitimate thing mm -hmm. um, but if you recognize that you say okay he's been totally fine this is just me putting stories maybe from a cheating ex or something on this um, I think it's still very important to express it but you don't have to do it in such a way that you make him responsible 
Uh, yeah. you don't, you, it makes me jealous when you talk to her. It makes me jealous. Babe, I literally have an open phone policy. Yeah, well, you should think more about my feelings. That's going to really pitch him away from you. Mm. As opposed to if you were to approach the conversation, let's say he notices your bullet or maybe you bring it up like, hey, I just want to let you know this is something I've been feeling and working on. Uh, I want to actually acknowledge you because I know this is nothing you've caused. You've you've had no, you've been wonderful to be honest. This is not something that that you have caused. I just want to let you know this is something I'm experiencing, and it's from I think my past, so it's something I'm working on. And I, I don't want you to change what you're doing. I actually I think it's this is good for me to work on this and to experience this. I just want to let you know this is what I'm feeling right now. And even though it doesn't make so much sense, it is something that's that's real for me. Uh, and then you're you're taking responsibility for the emotion, but you're also communicating it, which allows you to go deeper and mm. show him your truth. Yeah, Laura. So we were talking about that last night, like the difference between the criticism and the complaining. It's like you don't want to criticize the person's character and project the emotional responsibility onto them. You can complain about maybe what you're feeling on the inside, and like, hey, when those girls text, I, I feel this way. But as long as it's expressed in a way that doesn't project or push onto the other person. Yeah, I think this is even a level kind of above complaining where you're saying, this is just what I'm feeling and experiencing. Right. right? This is, I'm just, this is, this is my truth right now. I'm letting you know. Complaining would be, you know, you cause this. You're not a bad person, but you, you cause, like, your talking to them makes me feel this way. And then criticizing would be you're an asshole for doing this is when you actually go into character assassination about it. And that's right. obviously the most – people complain all the time and it's annoying, but most couples, as long as they don't go to criticism, do okay. Right. Um, but, yeah, you can even go a step higher above complaining, which is where you're just – you're speaking it, you're saying what's real for you. And it's not a complaint per se. It's more of an expression of, mm -hmm. of your truth. Mm. Even if it makes no sense, you can still express it without – because the guy response is like, oh, I need to change it. I've done something wrong. <laughs> and he's like, Actually, you've been fucking amazing, right? Yeah. You are the most loyal guy I've ever been with. So, like, huge kudos to you. This is just something I'm expressing that I'm dealing with. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Mark, thanks so much for taking the time out and being here, man. We really appreciate your time, your energy. My your pleasure. Energy. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was. It was great. Well, do you have any programs that you're doing right now? And, and where can people find you at? Yeah, we've got we've got a pretty I've got a pretty special program that I'm a new personal coaching program where we do a lot of calls with um some we got five women in there at the moment it's just been amazing we're doing group calls every week uh, so if you do want more information on that and kind of the the elite level program you can come in and probably just email me mark at makehimyours dot is the best way to find that uh, otherwise you can get a free if you just want to know a little bit more you can get a free chapter of my book first chapter of my book at makehimyours.com.au forward slash book. And you can just learn a bit more about the my book. Cool. Guys, if you want to check that out, the link's right there in the YouTube description box below. Uh, go ahead if that appeals to you. It's all, it's all there. Mark, thanks again, man. We really appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was real fun. I appreciate uh, it. Yeah, great. You've been really helpful. You've helped me and you've helped all the people watching as well. That'd be really great. Uh, thank you, guys. I see there's so many comments. Thank you for coming online and, and watching us today. Yeah, yeah. And guys, if you if you want, uh, Laura and I are continuing the Sacred Relationship series. So we still got about, what, two, two more months of this, right, Laura? Yeah. yeah. About two two yeah. more months. Um, we got Alex. You, I'm sure, Mark, You, I think you and Alex have done some work together. Alex Cormine? Yeah, we hung out in Miami. My favorite place. <laughs> oh, yeah. that, that probably would have been fun, I could imagine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's, like <laughs> he's good. He's good, yeah. No, I'm, Alex is a great. I've been really geeking out about it with Laura. I'm really excited. I have a thing. I love like French culture and French people. So I'm like really excited. We got that interview coming up uh, in two Hell days. Yeah. So, yeah. Hell yeah. Oh, well, I might tune in for that. Let me know what time it's on. I'll see if I can. <laughs> cool. yeah, on. We, will. we will. Well, thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Uh, we will see you in a couple of days when we go live again with Alex. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks for joining. Mwah.